Welcome to Postwave. You're here with Eric and Trevor. Today we're talking about some of the ramifications of social distancing as it affects people's mental health, and we're going to explore some of the surprising implications of that. quick disclaimer that we're two musicians and composers who like to talk about a bunch of topics that are sometimes slightly beyond our wheelhouse if we say anything that's factually incorrect or even if you just disagree with us we really love if you send us an email at postwavepodcast at gmail.com and uh let us know so eric what for you has been the hardest part of all this social distancing that we've been having to do these past i guess it's almost a year now Almost a year, yeah. This past year. Well, you know, at first it was when I was living with my grandmother, it was just the stress all the time of needing to to feel responsible for every smallest little action on my part as it might have the impact, the most drastic impact on my grandmother. Um, Mm -hmm. This was so highly taxing. I, I, I mean, it's hard to describe, but. <clears throat> I, I did eventually move out into my own place just so that I wouldn't have to worry about infecting my grandmother if I did get sick. Mm-hmm. Since then, being on my own, the hardest part has been the social isolation that has resulted from this. I am in the lucky minority of people for whom my financial situation was not drastically affected by the outbreak, by by the uh, shutdowns in response to the outbreak, I should say, rather. Mm -hmm. And so you mostly, you you teach music and you do landscaping stuff? Yeah. Yeah. And I have been able to continue with some social stuff that has kind of been my lifeline for these last several months. We have a a group who plays D&D together. We we meet up uh, up until recently outdoors and now we do it indoors with masks on but yeah for me just uh the the physical isolation from other people this has been a a major challenge as uh you know as you may be well aware humans are not meant to live in physical isolation there's a biological need a very real need to have physical contact with other people in order to be well yeah yeah and it totally makes sense why that would be if you think about evolution because people who are surrounded by a supportive community will tend to do a whole whole lot better than people who are just isolated on their own fending for themselves definitely and there's actually a lot of layers there that i just want to touch on briefly because it's really fascinating and important to recognize uh one layer is the uh as you said the community aspect the knowing that other people are are there for you and care for you another is maybe on a more interpersonal uh or or i should say person to person level have you ever felt with someone who, who you have prolonged physical contact with um, that your 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 touch with that person is a sort of language. Totally, totally. So I guess we should we should define what we mean by a physical contact. Mm. Yeah. So when I say physical contact, I mean literally uh, bodies touching bodies. <laughs> yeah. So th- would this be mostly in like a romantic? context or well like in what context well that, that, that's a thing where it gets pretty tricky um because it kind of gets wrapped up in some of our 
social eccentricities of our of our culture and it's mm-hmm. true that in our culture the vast majority of physical contact happens solely through romantic uh connections whereas in a lot of other cultures that's not normal at all people touch each other as a everyday social sort of thing yeah and i know that's definitely a lot more true for men than it is for women because w- women tend to be better about showing affection to their friends like physically than than guys do mm-hmm. and guys need to show that they're not homo <laughs> yeah <laughs> um no I, I i i make light of that but there's there's a a serious um feeling of isolation that that comes from that in our culture and so i think what's so striking now that we have this drive or this um how, how would you describe the social distancing phenomena is it like a, a so it's not a social imperative because it's, it's more artificial than that it's like a how would you describe it well i mean it's it's become unnecessarily politicized mm. I mean, it's um, the uh, again. I, every time we have these discussions, I know you don't like left and right, but uh, it tends to be that people on the left encourage more of it, while people on the right encourage less of it. Mm-hmm. And there's kind of a as someone as someone who supports pretty much all the social distancing that's happening. There is kind of like a holier than thou aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Same thing with with mask wearing. That I, I feel like people perceive it that way that's definitely not how it should be but Mm. for better or for worse that's kind of how it i don't know it's at least how i imagine it coming off Mm -hmm. yeah definitely and i imagine that that people who are opposed to it and conservative people in general kind of see it that way yeah so so we've got this kind of political drive to social distance and this is kind of striking us just in in really the most vulnerable place here because we have a society where we're so isolated already. Yeah, well, I agree. We're definitely we're definitely isolated. Maybe I mean, you know, we were definitely isolated before the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Maybe more than at any time in in recent history. Although it's it's interesting because in a way the internet has united us more, but it's it's kind of via these super specific niche communities you can find on the internet like on reddit mm-hmm. and tumblr and that kind of thing uh you, you know even facebook because they have the groups now that like a lot of people are part of me and me included so it, like people are connected in that way but it's it's not the same thing as being connected to people who are actually around you and and like you were saying physically around you definitely yeah there's there's that interpersonal exchange that happens in in the present moment that the exchanges on the internet can only go so far to replicate. Yeah. Yeah. Or they're, they're always centered around, you know, certain topics or, mm-hmm. or that kind of thing. And, mm-hmm. and it's not the same as having someone you just hang out with and, and talk about whatever, you know, totally. Um, so, so one other element about uh, physical touch and, and isolation in regards to that is, is actually our microbiomes. You know, we as a species mm-hmm. have sort of evolved to exchange uh, critters, you know, and and in mm-hmm. so doing, create a robust immune system. Mm-hmm. And if you have a s- situation where people are physically isolated so that they're not having that exchange, every individual is making themselves more vulnerable to health considerations yeah yeah that's definitely true and i know i know i saw at least once that there's going to be like the the cold and flu season hasn't been has been like way better in general because people have been isolating more you know Mm. but i saw that it's probably going to result in like a drastic rebound where because people haven't built up immunity and and the um it hasn't been exchanging people in in exactly the same way it's going to be a lot worse once it does come back. Definitely. So what has been the hardest part for you about for, for being forced to socially isolate? Um, 
honestly, I would probably say like addiction. <laughs> Tell me more about that. Um, so, I mean, you know, people who are curious about it can go back to our motivation and addiction episode, but um, like substances and the internet kind of in general, I think, whether it's like news or I guess the the main two things for me are like uh, <laughs> uh news news and porn in general like the the things is really hard to to stay away from mm. um and not like overdue um so and it's it's like cuz cuz for for both of those things like like it's always an option cuz you're always you're you know you're home all day next to your computer or your phone and it's like yeah it's kind it's kind of omnipresent mm. the potential for it so you're you're feeling that being forced to stay in your home more often rather than getting out and interacting with people encourages you to engage with your addictive behaviors more readily. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, stuff like day drinking and, uh, you know, other substances <laughs> during the day because mm-hmm. you don't have to drive anywhere. Like it makes that, it makes that more available too. So definitely. Um, yeah. Yeah, so this is one of the statistics that was just so drastically sh- shocking. And there's a lot of really stunning uh, data about mental health. And I think, uh, so So I'm looking at the website kff.org. They have an article about how the social distancing affects mental health and substance use. And I think it's something like substance use has tripled since the outbreak yeah yeah i think that's right and this is this is the uh kff stands for kaiser family foundation which is uh an organization that tries to produce very balanced nonpartisan news coverage that kind of thing Mm. yeah this this article is kind of like a uh tidal wave of of statistics (laughs) yeah each one more crushing than the last. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so real quick before we go on, let, let's just kind of go over some of the some of the main points here. In the article? Yeah, so, or some of the main statistics that, uh, that are relevant here. Mm-hmm. So I think for me, the thing that, that first struck me was this figure that as of mid-July, 50 three percent of adults in the united states reported that their mental health has been negatively impacted due to worry and stress over the coronavirus yeah i mean i'm way surprised that number isn't higher but yeah but that's the thing that is as of mid-july if you look back just Mm -hmm. to march that is the number is 32 percent so from march Uh to july it raised by about 20 percent yeah, I mean, if I remember correctly, in most places in the U.S. in March, a lot of people were wondering whether it was even going to be, like, a, a huge problem. Like, I think a lot of people still doubted that it was going to basically be everywhere and causing a huge crisis everywhere. Yeah, yeah. So we, we see this uh, steady increase from March through July. Basically, every month it is linearly more affected. Mm-hmm. And um, if you think about it, so there, so th- this data is from July, right? So July, you know, is it's just starting to roll into summer. If you remember, uh, I don't know how it was in Austin, but here in Massachusetts, the social climate was very much people were starting to really get a lot more laid back. They were finally able to get outdoors, um, interact with people in, in ways, and, and just people were so much less stressed out then. Um, and if you compare that to once the weather started getting colder again, go, going into fall and now into winter, it's kind of like night and day. Yeah, well, I, I remember July, the beginning of July was when shit really hit the fan in Austin and we were seeing like, 600 700 cases a day for a week or two mm-hmm. and yeah so that was kind of when it was most intense here actually okay and uh, would you say it's yeah. kind of uh, lessened since then well now it's it's back to even worse than it was in july mm. um mm-hmm. i think we we had like 
1,500 new cases the other day, which is way more than, that's almost double what it was in, in July ever. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard because the, like Austin would otherwise enact all these restrictions on bars and restaurants and stuff. But the, because we're in Texas, the governor can just like overrule those mm-hmm. and say that the cities can't make regulations. So, mm. or like they, they can only, I guess, the, the state restrictions are the only mandatory ones and they tend to be less uh less strict mm-hmm. so yeah it checks out that july would be like a peak of of depression and stuff like that great and and so um this gets more interesting as well when we break it up by age bracket now it's kind of surprising because you you might think that older people who are much more susceptible to you know, maybe dying from the disease, you think they might Mm -hmm. be more worried about it. But the... Yeah, I was surprised by that. Yeah, yeah. This is just a sick... So so the data shows that um, this is a survey done by the CDC. 62.9% of 18 to 24-year-olds reported an anxiety or depressive disorder. A quarter said they were using more drugs and alcohol to cope with pandemic-related stress, and a quarter said that they had seriously considered suicide in the previous 30 days. Yeah. One yeah. quarter <laughs> of people aged 18 to 24. Yeah, that's that's pretty that's pretty staggering. <laughs> so what do you think about this? Well, let's let's get. I guess let's start getting into your more specific argument about about this whole thing. Mm-hmm. So, after reading these data about how drastically symptoms of anxiety and depressive disorder have increased during the p- pandemic, by the way, in comparison to the previous year, twenty nineteen, the figure of around forty to fifty percent was at the same time last year was about 11 percent so Hmm. that's a four to five fold increase due to the pandemic Mm -hmm. and and that that's that's the most conservative as we were saying it's very likely that those numbers are much higher by now Mm -hmm. so I, i started thinking about in terms of how is this social distancing affecting people and at what point is it causing more damage than it's doing to help right right so i guess initially my my first question is what's what's the trade-off between deaths and and decreases in in quality of life like i feel like the 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 unit of the the quality adjusted life year the the quality like i feel like there should kind of be a a steep drop off in in terms of if someone actually dies mm-hmm. like it's not like you can linear, linearly uh i guess to get uh to go with the example you gave is like people say that on average life with aids is about 50% mm-hmm. as good as it is without right yeah, hey, so so let's let's back up just a second and kind of go over the the mechanics. So let's jump into the details of how this quality adjusted life years concept works. So this is an idea that we first talked about in the Doing Good Better episode. This was a episode about the book by William McCaskill. And in this book, he presents this metric that is used fairly commonly in economics and and social sciences to sort of try to quantify that, try to quantify what is a life worth? What is life worth? And there's, there's actually a pretty surprisingly intuitive way we can approach that, which is imagine you had some chronic pain Maybe you have a a bad hip that causes you pain constantly. Now, you could live with this, and maybe you'd live for 10 years. Or maybe you can get a surgery which will 
reduce your lifespan three years so that you only get to live seven years, but you can live without pain anymore. And the question is, how bad would the pain have to be for you to want to get that surgery? Yeah, so so qualities are, are commonly used, as in the case of do, doing good better, to try to figure out the impact of different interventions you could do mm-hmm. in a person's life, like, like you were talking about with a medical procedure or in the case of uh, charity and philanthropy, which is what doing good better is about improving someone's life by, you know, providing them a mosquito bed net or, or a well or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like how, how much good does that actually do for someone's life? And so you can measure, measure that with, with qualities. Mm -hmm. Now, um, one, perhaps one, perhaps shortcoming of quality adjusted life years is that it is based on people's self-reported experience of how bad their experience is and you know this actually can go quite a long way but it's just good to recognize that it's not 100 percent accurate yeah and it and it is an average of you know what a bunch of people say and i'd I'd like to see that like the distribution for for these because i'm sure different things are have like very different distributions as far as yeah, how, how many how many people differ and to like what degree? Certainly. So he, he presents some examples. So one example, as you mentioned, is that people who have untreated AIDS will present their life as being 50% as good as life at full health. Mm-hmm. So we could take that uh, a couple ways. You could say someone with AIDS might say, it looks like I'll probably get to live for another 20 years. But if I could live only another 10 years, but be in great health, I might do that. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, the other way we can take this, rather than uh, going directly to uh, cutting the lifespan down, is we can take it in terms of risk, right? Right. Someone might say they're willing to face a 50% risk of death in order to have their ailment cured immediately. Right, right. Now, he presents another pretty shocking piece of information here, which is that people with moderate depression report their life on average as being only 30% as good as a life in full health. Right, which which from from my experience with depression checks out. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and like t- t- to that totally makes sense. I mean t- to consider people who have s- suicidal thoughts to think about mm-hmm. wanting to die as as already you're thinking about it's not worth it, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, the the thing with depression is it kind of directly affects the assessment of your quality of life itself. Mm. You know, like, I feel like it, it affects the assessment part less than, like, maybe it affects the assessment part more than the quality part, if that makes any sense. Like, the because mm. objectively, whatever that means in this case, because <laughs> it's not really an objectively, but, but like, you could be assessing your life as, as worse than it actually is. Yeah, you're right. I, I think that's a, a really interesting thing to explore, and that, that could potentially be the case a lot of the time. I can't say that for sure, because it seems to me also, like, who who's to judge what someone's ex- life experience is other than that person? And Right, exactly. Yeah, in that yeah. moment. Like, there there really is no objective experience of life. Right, and at the end of the day, that that person can't do anything about it, really, even if it is, I mean, pro- probably can't, it's not as easier for them to affect change, it's just sna- snapping their fingers and, and you know, deciding to, to snap out of it. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely more more challenging than people who haven't had the experience may, may make it out to be. Yeah, because I think people, a lot of people, 
tend to compare it to like pe- people uh, who have who haven't actually had like serious or like moderate depression will tend to compare it to like getting bummed out that you know a certain event didn't go the way you you wanted it to even something like a like a breakup mm-hmm. like it's it's different because it it kind of doesn't bounce back yeah not not that something serious like a breakup can't cause actual depression but um yeah i, I just know a lot of people who haven't had experience with it tend to to think less of it because they compare it to these these lesser occurrences in their mm. in their lives so, so you'd say from your own experience then that it's pretty reasonable this this assessment that life with depression moderate depression is only 30 percent as good as life in full health i think so yeah i think so maybe maybe this is a good time to go into i think what's my main criticism of this sure which is that the the people who are not the people who are affected by the anxiety and depression and and suicidal ideation are not necessarily the ones who are most directly impacted by risk of getting the the virus because that that's mostly you know frontline workers essential employees and it's really and you know me- medical staff it, and it's really those people who we should be thinking of and and looking out for when you know when we're choosing how to go to go about our lives because they they don't really have a, a choice as to their level of of risk mm. and 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 if so, so if you do, then it's kind of your responsibility to th- think about those people and kind of, you know, t- take one for the team as much as you can. It's not that you want to, you know, put the whole world on your shoulders, but I think, yeah, my, my main criticism is that the, the people who are, we're talking about two different groups of people here, and we're talking about one group potentially dying or getting really sick versus another group of people's assessment of their mental health. And I think because they're two different groups, you can't really make the argument you're making. That's a really interesting assertion. I'd love to explore that because, well, well, let me just ask you though. um, So you've presented that um, the high risk group in terms of coronavirus exposure or, or rather serious injury or death from coronavirus exposure as being the uh, healthcare workers. Um, I, I wonder about that because the death toll for the coronavirus is less than 2%. So perhaps it's more, would you say it's more in line that um, the people at, who are high risk are the people with poor immune systems such as the elderly? Yeah, so so I guess I guess the main group I'm I'm worried about is is like I said people who are frontline essential workers which which tend to be poorer and you know often people of color who might not be as good in health. I mean that that's one of the reasons that that the the virus has like disproportionately impacted the black communities is is just kind of they tend to have have more uh occurrences of like heart disease and that kind of thing. So, um, and, and, you know, those, those are the same people who tend to be these, these frontline workers. Hmm. That's really interesting. I, I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, so, but let's put a pin, pin in that because I, I want to get to the other part of what you said, that if you have two separate groups of people, then you can't really make an argument for the one group of people if it's putting the other group group of people at risk yeah yeah so i mean well i i don't know i don't know if if i don't know if you could apply that logic to other situations but i feel like that's definitely true in this situation that's really interesting um because because i've actually heard it cut the other way um i i was talking to a woman who i i i shared this idea that perhaps social distancing is causing more damage than than it's helping and she said that makes sense to her because she says that she has two or three friends who had died from overdoses due to overindulging in substances due to being socially isolated 
and she asked me, who are we all to say that their lives weren't worth saving mo any more than the lives of people who are at risk of death from coronavirus? Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's a good point. I, I'm, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm not trying to say that their lives are worth less, but um, the, Im the impact of the virus itself is less direct, you know what I mean? And there are other interventions that you could mm -hmm. have, like therapy and, and, and that kind of thing that, that would uh, ameliorate that problem in, the, in a way that the, the virus problem itself can't really be ameliorated. Hmm, interesting. I, I don't necessarily agree with you on that point, but I, th I think that that is a, a still a valid point and, and worth considering. To me, it seems that I, I've seen a lot of articles that sort of take the stance that mental health, oh yeah, these people, they're, they're suffering. And so, of course, the solution is that we need to have, um, you know, therapy and like, professional mental health services for mm -hmm. these people to me that is entirely missing the nature of what it is to suffer mental health did you know um during the vietnam war there were a lot of soldiers who were injured and became reliant upon morphine to uh, deal with the pain and, and and then became addicted to it and it was a very serious problem there were a lot of soldiers addicted to morphine and there was a theory at the time that when all these soldiers come home and become veterans we're going to have a serious problem on our hand there's going to be a lot more addicts on the streets but what actually happened uh, to a great extent the majority of those people who were addicted to morphine in the war, their addiction absolutely vanished when they came home. And the reason this was, as far as people know, is that they suddenly had their community, they had their friends and family and everyone looking out for them, and they didn't need that morphine in order to feel well. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I think I had heard about that before. It's pretty, pretty miraculous, and and I think part of it too is, well, I think I think a lot of them realized, to get home at all, they would have to kick the habit, mm -hmm. that like their, you know, their their spouses or or family just probably wouldn't tolerate it. Um, maybe maybe that was a part of it, but but yeah, yeah, sure. So it seems to me that it's maybe kind of missing the point uh, when these articles say that. We should just look for other ways to f fix people's mental health when the, the cause is the social isolation it is the stress right well i think i think it's not just solving mental health problems through things you know traditional things like therapy or, or medication or whatever it's it's more about getting out of that so social isolation definitely however you can even if it's you know not in in person interaction, but you know, I mean, like something like your D and D group could fairly easily be done remotely. I feel like. Well, you know, that's the thing, and we tried it. We tried it for months, actually, last winter, doing remote, and it was really hard. It was not. Yeah. It was not the same. It was not yeah. something that we could have continued doing that way. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, D D and D is is complicated, but well, no, no, no. I mean, the mechanic of it was great. We've been using this online platform called Roll Twenty that really streamlines everything. We had the, the group mm -hmm. chat, and you know, mechanically, it's like perfect for that. But mm -hmm. simply interacting with people in that group d remote environment, it's extremely limited. What kinds of exchanges and interactions you can actually have yeah yeah this is this that's actually something i've been thinking about with with zoom and everything because i had this zoom happy hour with this new music choir i'm part of 
a week or two ago mm. and i was thinking like whenever you know whenever you have one of those things with more than i don't know more than like four or five people it ends up kind of being one person talking to the other other you know however many people mm. at a time yeah and there's not an opportunity for like people to mix and people for, you know for people to have conversations in these, in these little groups mm -hmm. they keep you know being shuffled around and i feel like someone should design some kind of social platform that lets people do that <laughs> yeah yeah could could uh help a bit <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean yeah obviously that doesn't solve every problem but mm -hmm. yeah and then the other thing i want to just say is that it's um also probably not feasible to think about finding like professional mental health solutions for every american i just mm -hmm. you know we, we'd have to like have half of us become psychologists in order to have there be enough psychologists yeah so so i think you kind of maybe address this in what in what you sent me but how do you know that the increased depression and suicides and overdoses are related to the isolation itself and not just the kind of constant low level unsettled emotion that is is a result of the, the virus and the kind of the constant background fear of getting it and it being serious mm -hmm. like how, how do you tease apart that effect from the effect of the isolation that's a really, really good question. Um, and the answer is I don't, but those smart people over at KFF seem to have it worked out pretty well. Um, yeah. Pull up the, the data here. Now, I think a large part of their approach here is that we know there are certain triggers, certain causes for these mental health disorders. We have data, we, we have uh, data as well from previous pandemics um, and so we can kind of like it, for example if we know that social isolation causes depression then if we have increased social isolation and then see that there's increased depression it's probably a pretty safe bet that at least a large part of that is uh, caused by by that and so one of the other really big causes of stress is the financial situation of a lot of Americans, a lot of people around the world. Yeah. So I guess, I guess my, my main argument would be that this might be a correlation versus causation thing. Tell me how. Well, cause the virus is causing both the isolation and the increased anxiety depression, but the anxiety depression is not. Uh, I mean, it's okay. So, so isolation is probably having some effect, but certainly, yeah, um, yeah. I I just think in the in this particular situation, it's really hard to to tease apart which effects are happening where. You're you're right. I think it's a very complicated situation, and when we say there is a causation from from the social isolation causing the depression. I mean, I, I, th I still think we can fairly safely say that is happening, probably a fair extent, but we can't say for sure how much exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, um, one of the other striking figures here is regarding anxiety due to people losing income. And the, the KFF article here says... Data from recent KFF tracking polls found that a higher share of households that lost income or employment reported negative mental health impacts from worry or stress over the coronavirus than households that have not lost income or employment, 46% versus 32% respectively in the poll conducted in mid-May, and 58% versus 50% respectively in the poll conducted in mid-July. Yeah, again, this whole article is just kind of a numbers, mm -hmm. like, yeah. deluge of numbers. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that that kind of, I feel like that one is 
Like it's it's exactly what you'd expect, kind of like with a lot of these. But um, I guess I guess so. I so I guess my main my main question now is is like what's your proposal? Like what do you think we should actually do? And like like if Biden could <laughs> the day he's inaugurated, knock on wood, <laughs> uh, if he could give some like national directive that everyone would follow. Okay. Even if it's like based on on like you know what what the cases are like in in specific areas, like it could be different for different places. Sure, but... sure, sure. So let me get to yeah. that in just a second. Um, that is a re really good question. I just want to go over this statement I've just made about anxiety um, to to just kind of make sense of of what this means exactly. So mm -hmm. so it's saying that mid May, um, people who had lost income were more affected. Uh, by anxiety than people who did not lose income by about two thirds, right? You have uh, thirty percent mm -hmm. of people affected who did not lose income, and forty six percent who did. So, mm -hmm. so half again is as bad for the people who did lose income. Now, if we compare that, mm -hmm. the numbers kind of come down a bit by mid May. It's it's already down to fifty eight percent versus fifty percent, so that's that's mm -hmm. a, a much smaller margin. Now, so mm -hmm. so this would imply that the percentage of people suffering from mental health is, while of course, anxiety about losing income is a major drive here. We can see from the numbers it only accounts for a smaller proportion of people experiencing mental health disorders and so other causes are likely to be things like social so social isolation and stress from engaging with media about coronavirus that induces people to be fearful yeah yeah i, I think that's that's a pretty that's a pretty solid argument totally okay so yeah so you're not you're not really worried of so much about like the economic impact that the the lockdowns are having it's more about the isolation yeah and, and definitely the economic impact is a huge consideration that um i think would probably strengthen the point that i'm trying to make here and i'm leaving it out mm -hmm. entirely because i'm not an economic econ economist i can't even say the word right <laughs> uh, <laughs> economist, economist. <laughs> and, and uh, my argument also doesn't need that in order to stand up yeah i guess that makes sense if you're enjoying what you're listening to so far and you want to support us somehow there's lots of ways you can do that you can go follow us on facebook or instagram or visit us online at postwavepodcast.com or send us a nice email at postwavepodcast at gmail.com you can also follow us on your podcasting platform of choice we're on pretty much everyone out there Give us a nice review if you're on a platform that supports that or a five-star rating. Thanks for listening. Cool. So let me, let me now break down some of the the math so so i took these data from kff and from other major sources and i wondered what would happen if we ran this through the quality adjusted life years equation so so here are some of my base numbers so we have the total us population is 328 million and as as of the time uh, a few weeks ago the covid death toll was 333,000 people in the U.S. This is all the U.S. because it's easier to do data about the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and total U.S. COVID cases is 19 million, which means that the average COVID mortality rate is 1.75%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that all that'll checks out to me. But, but how did you get this this projected U.S. deaths number? Of you, you say five hundred sixty-seven thousand one hundred ninety-five. Okay, so I actually t 
took that from a website that I will find again and put in the notes. So, so th this pro this is the projected U.S. deaths by April, which is about five hundred sixty-seven thousand, as he said. By by this coming April. This coming April. Okay. Yeah. I get, my other question was when, like by when. Yeah. So I mean, like, I there are definitely going to be a significant number of deaths mm -hmm. after that. Absolutely. And so yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's really important to recognize that. And so, 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 like for example, if if we keep going, let's just say randomly, it were to keep more or less burning on at the same rate as it is now, then we'll have five hundred thousand people dying every year. Let's say for three mm -hmm. years, you know, that's already a million and a half people. Um, mm -hmm. But. I didn't have any of the data for that. We can't know the future. So I'm just using the absolute most conservative, about 550,000 uh, by April. Mm -hmm. So if we uh, do that math, so we have uh, 567 subtracted from 328 million is, you know, 327 million and a half uh, remaining mm -hmm. U.S. citizens. Now... I used, uh, again, the conservative figures uh, that 40% of people are suffering from mental health disorders akin to moderate depression. So we have 60% of citizens who are not suffering from mental health disorders. And that represents, if you multiply 60% by 328 million, we get 196 mm -hmm. million 800,000 quality adjusted life years. Now we add this figure to the 40% of American citizens who are experiencing anxiety and depression, and, and we multiply that by 0.3. That 0.3 meaning that their life experience could be rated as 30% as good as when in full health. And this yields uh, thirty nine million three hundred and sixty equality just with life years. So for this hypothetical projected probable situation, if we keep going as we are, by April we'll have two hundred and thirty six million quality adjusted life years. Yeah, I mean that all that all that all makes sense to me. Yeah, right. So kinda kinda just doing the, the basic arithmetic. So, so we have this number, right? The 236 million quality adjusted life years. Now, for our intents and pur purposes, we can basically consider this as a score, right? And the higher the score, the greater number of qualities, the better this situation is, right? Right, right. Cool. So let's examine some other hypothetical situations. So now let's just imagine, hypothetically, what if we all just said, fuck it all, we're going to go lick each other's eyeballs and get everyone sick right away. Let's just let everyone uh -huh. die, right? Everyone uh -huh. who's going to die is going to die. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anyone who, who die is going to die, Eric Mulhern for president. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is kind of the worst case scenario as uh as the liberal media would put it today. Um <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the I do Ben Shapiro impression gets so much lower. <laughs> <laughs> anyway so, so this is kind of the, wor the worst case situation right that a lot of people are terrified of you know what's the worst mm -hmm. that could happen everyone gets sick and as a result five million seven hundred and forty thousand people will have died yeah so isn't this kind of what what sweden did and what the uk was going to do for a little bit, which is try to get to herd immunity basically as fast as possible. Um, tell me more about that. I heard, I've heard some conflicting reports of what actually happened, but uh, what have you heard? I mean, I heard, uh, I guess I only pretty much know what I just said, um, which is that 
yeah, I think the UK said they were going to do it at first, but then then changed their mind. And then Sweden, I think, has done has had that policy pretty much through the whole thing. But let's let's look it up real quick. Sure. Okay, interesting. So this is just from the the Wikipedia article on on the coronavirus in in Sweden. So basically, th- their approach is pretty controversial, and it looks like the main reason that they couldn't do more stringent lockdowns they were they were so so the reason for that is that the Swedish constitution legal legally protects the freedom of movement for the people in in peacetime. So so like the government is federally by their constitution not really really allowed to institute a lockdown. Mm. So they have a bunch of kind of uh voluntary social distancing measures that they can suggest but they're not really able to uh enforce them. Mm. And it sounds from this article like the government has considered their their efforts a failure and have kind of backtracked as well. Interesting. So it's not really that they're striving for herd immunity just that they don't have the legal structure to be able to m- mandatorily pursue social distancing. I, I guess so. I, I didn't know that detail, so that's uh, that is kind of food for thought. Hmm. I, I do know. I, I remember the UK specifically was was talking about herd immunity, hmm. and, and that's interesting. And I've heard for the UK as well. It was kind of like there's a lot of push for Boris Johnson to you know, do social distancing and stuff. And he just kind of, you know, blundered around and didn't let it happen and didn't do it. And, and then Mm -hmm. it was like, Oh yeah, that's their strategy. Um, yeah, it's not that we're just not paying attention and not caring. It's, it's rather that we're attempting to get herd immunity. Yeah. Yeah. I I wouldn't be surprised (laughs) at that. (laughs) What I know about Boris Johnson. (laughs) Jeez. (laughs) that fucker with a mop on his head okay so yeah so what if we just ended social distancing and started um having makeout sessions so five million seven hundred and forty thousand people would die in the u.s from the disease and the remaining population would be about 322 million mm-hmm Now, to calculate the quality-adjusted life years, I did a further step to be extra conservative here. Now, I'm not going to assume that 100% of mental health problems is due to social distancing entirely, Mm -hmm. rather than some of it being about the disease itself. So, you know, I I don't know the numbers. I, I don't think we have this data be very interesting to know but so i just assumed half of the cause of mental health problems is due to social distancing and subsequent social isolation decrease in income etc and 50 percent is due to just people being scared of the disease itself right right so i just assume 50 50 right but you you didn't do that for all these these calculations right like I think the next one you said assuming yeah right so so the, so the next one I did just assuming 100% but what uh what I found so fascinating was that even doing this more conservative approach well let's just see how the numbers run out so we have 322 million remaining citizens and uh the, the way my conservative conservative estimates come out is 74.5% of citizens not suffering from mental health disorders due to Mm -hmm. COVID-19, which results in 240 million qualies. And add that to the 25% of, uh, 25.5% of citizens who are experiencing anxiety and depression due to uh, social isolation, et cetera, is um, 82 million times that 0.3 value that represents the 30% as good as full health uh, results in twenty four million six hundred and fifty thousand quality adjusted life years, for a total of two hundred and sixty four million seven hundred quality adjusted life years. Right, right. So now, now remember, this is just our score. This is like our the bigger the number, the better. And if we compare that 
to our projected outcome as of now, continuing with social distancing, the, the number of quality adjusted life years for just saying screw it all is higher than our current projected estimate. Right. Although, I mean, I, I would say in the grand scheme of things, it's not higher by much, given that we're talking about figures that are in the hundreds of millions and this is the difference of like 30 million which i guess it isn't isn't insignificant but <laughs> it's not insignificant uh, in the slightest <laughs> i mean i i don't I, I don't know if it's extreme enough to to warrant the wh whatever policy you're proposing which i guess we'll we'll get to mm -hmm. well well and, and so here's the thing is i'm not particularly proposing any policy i think there are a lot of things we could do that will be way better and way smarter than just saying fuck it all. I think that that that's really kind of the worst case situation, except for the only situation worse than that, according to these figures, is to continue with social distancing as we have been. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess I guess the th what, I guess what I've heard is is there are countries that have that have successfully cut their numbers down without lockdowns and i think like south korea and hong kong i want to say um and germany i think in the beginning at least uh were able to just keep them down through like testing all over the place and you know building up the in infrastructure for that and then also uh contact tracing mm -hmm. and there there is less of a need for for the kind of social distancing well maybe not social distancing but but definitely like the, the lockdowns yeah that's really fascinating I, I think contact tracing is really a, a key element because you're always going to have some risk of exposure and really the only way you can prevent that exposure apart from shutting yourself and your life off and down from everyone else is to be able to selectively do so when you know that you have been compromised. Uh, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Well, it's the same approach as we used to eradicate polio. As uh, So this was another, uh, another thing that William McCastell talks about in his Doing Good Better. There's only one virus that humanity has ever wiped out completely, and that is polio. It took us decades of hard, concerted effort globally mm -hmm. and eventually we did it and th the way th that they did this was through very specifically targeting the communities that were most heavily affected and you know it, contact tracing being very selective about where their attention was placed in in, in trying to fight it huh that's interesting hasn't hasn't smallpox also been eradicated or am I making that up I don't know if it maybe um I, I'm, I'm just saying what William McCaskill said but that would be interesting yeah yeah I mean we, yeah it, it's eradicated it is yeah okay the last the last this is again this is Wikipedia the last naturally occurring case was diagnosed in October 1977 okay wow cool so 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 maybe polio isn't the only one anymore yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, that the the doing good better book came out in like 2014 or something like that. Yeah, that's that's curious. Maybe I'm maybe I'm misquoting him about it being the only one. But that that would, that would be something worth worth looking into. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure it was it was probably through a similar strategy. Certainly. So, it seems to me that there's so many different things that we could be doing that don't involve having this drastic negative impact on our quality of life yeah what are like the alternative mechanisms that you suggest well now here again i i'm not an expert <laughs> um what, what you're saying about south korea and germany that seems like uh, a very promising route um contract tracing seems to me like a very effective method yeah, so, so I guess I don't really have a clean answer for you. I don't know what the best approach would be. All I know is that it doesn't seem to me like the best approach is through continuing social distancing. Now, um, I know that's, that's a very 
controversial thing to say right now, especially as uh, a member of the left, as Ben Shapiro would put it. <laughs> I, don't know, I, I know that a lot of people have extreme, uh, f- feel extremely nervous about any such proposition as uh, reducing social distancing. I know it's a, a major concern for a lot of people. A lot of people are scared for their own livelihoods, for their own lives. And this, I, I also want to recognize right now that this is not an argument that I could have made several months ago when I was living with my grandmother. You know, having that immediate and direct personal threat to, to my f- close family member I could not have mm-hmm. looked at this objectively and said, this is what the numbers seem to imply. I, I think it all comes down to how many people are, are your, are your actions impacting. So like if you're able to, you know, you, you live by yourself and you're basically only interacting with other people who are also out about and decided to be less stringent. Totally. Then I think that's more okay than if you're, you're inadvertently spreading it to people who 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 aren't but but then it comes back to the whole you're while you're out you're inevitably interacting with people who have less of a choice about whether they can stop working or work from home or not and they they have less control over over that mm-hmm. and so you 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 know inevitably inevitably you're going to be impacting someone else negatively while you're kind of gaining gaining the benefit of being more lenient about about social distancing stuff. That's absolutely true. So, so another thing I want to uh, address here, though, is that a lot of people and 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 it. Uh, let me say as well, my my perspective here is probably not representative of the global community or the the community across the country. My local community has a lot of affluent people, a lot of people who do not have immediate stress related to losing income and who do have the flexibility to stay in out of fear or caution. Now, in this environment that I'm in, in this environment I'm in, it seems that the approach that everyone who is taking, who is being extremely cautious, which is the vast majority of people, is to assume that everyone else is potentially compromised, right? It's isolate 100% from everyone to the greatest ability that you can because you can. Has this been your experience as well? I mean... I mean, it depends how bad it is. I mean, yeah. I mean, in Austin, we have like five different stages with fa- with stage five being like the, the most stringent when the, the virus numbers are up the highest. Mm. And I think even then it's maybe like no more than five people, that kind of thing. Mm. I don't think it's people meeting a one-on-one isn't the huge problem. The, the, and the thing that they're worried about, right, isn't isn't people getting sick. It's it's people getting sick too fast that they and they overwhelm the hospital system yeah, definitely. and then people you know people who need other procedures done are, are affected or you know if they have emergencies mm-hmm. that kind of thing certainly yeah that's another huge element of this um but yeah. so it's, it seems to me that if you have the means to be socially isolating yourself if you have chosen to do so then it seems entirely reasonable that everyone outside of that, the general public, should be free to be sick, you know? Like, if the assumption is that you can't interact with people because they may infect you, the people might as well have the freedom to be able to... uh, live up to that <laughs> yeah i mean okay so so like sure if, if they get sick and it's mild or they're asymptomatic or it's just moderate mm-hmm. you know as, as long as they don't have to go to the hospital like sure but some some fraction of them are going to end up going to the hospital and, and like i said clogging up the system mm-hmm. and and just making it overflow so 
yeah, it's 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 not going to be, you know, even even if the people who are, who are who tend to be, more leaning about about restricting their social interaction, even even if those people tend to be be on the younger side, I think it's it's still, it's still a consideration you have to make. Certainly. I also think, uh, I think maybe I mentioned this earlier, but I think you do have to kind of take into account the decrease in mental health uh, to healthcare workers as the the cases mount because i know there have been like so many cases of people breaking down or you know leaving the profession Mm -hmm. and i I think you have to you have to include that too that that is the as the cases go up more and more steeply that the the impact on those people is going to be that much more certainly and and i wonder though because it it, it's kind of like a once you're at hospital capacity then the situation is bad for those people and leading up to that it's not nearly as bad right but once you cross over that threshold even if you're just a couple people over that threshold you've you've gone past the limit i mean i know in austin we have like an outside uh i don't know if it's outside it's at the convention center like off-site kind of makeshift hospital Mm -hmm. because it's already overflowing yeah so i think i think the main thing from what i've heard is is staff more than space because even even before the hospital overflows uh you know they're they're you know people who don't usually work in the the icu or on like you know infectious disease patients you know are are brought in that kind of thing and and the other uh the other consideration is that like a lot of hospitals uh oxygen systems are being overstressed Mm -hmm. i didn't know this but you know the, the hospital has like one or maybe several disconnected ones, but it's not like every patient has the individual oxygen tank. There's like a system to get oxygen to the whole hospital mm-hmm. um, in most places, I think. And and from what I understand, that that's overstressed in a lot of places and it can't quite keep up with the demands of people's oxygen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, can we, can we just real quickly address that the hospital is probably like the least healthy place you can be if, you, if you're sick? <laughs> what do you mean by that <laughs> well uh i've heard i've heard uh reports about how people who work in hospitals who have that extremely sterile work environment that their m- gut microbiome becomes much less robust and within a very short time span, something like a week, maybe two weeks, they become extremely much more susceptible to catching diseases and being ne- negatively affected that by them. That's interesting. I mean, I think for someone whose case is already, you're, I mean, you're probably only going to get people to the hospital who, who got that bad before they went there, mm. and they need like oxygen support. Or, or more you okay, know gotcha and so like like increasing their situation is kind of I mean, if you know it, increasing the severity of their situation from the immune stuff uh like i don't think that should even be a concern because you have to like yeah, have it be right. bad enough before you get to the yeah, hospital there's the more immediate concern of breathing as opposed to yeah. being well enough to get better so so this is this is another really important aspect of this whole complicated messy situation is the effect that being in good health has on your susceptibility to having serious health impact due to covid yeah tell tell me more about that because so uh i don't have the specific numbers right in front of me but from what i've heard from pretty major sources there's a very extreme reaction of, of having a good immune system to uh, your your ability to have COVID without any severe lasting effects. There's a news story I heard about someone who worked at a soup kitchen in Boston, and they were working with, you know, I, I forget the numbers, let's say like 100, 200 homeless people. Uh, so the person was extremely surprised that during the peak of this outbreak, none of the homeless people seem to have the virus. You'd, you'd expect that some of them would be symptomatic if if 
any of them had the virus. So they went and they tested this homeless population, and it turned out they all had the virus. It's just that none of them were symptomatic. None of them had serious health impacts from this out of you know a pretty large sample size. Mm-hmm. So what the theory is, why these people were so able to, to kick the virus without having any symptoms whatsoever or, or any serious lasting effects is that they're on the street exposed to a much richer microbiome so that their immune system is far more healthy, far more sturdy than someone who is more socially isolated. Huh, that That is super interesting. And how do you think you can find the source for that? I will definitely find the source for that. Yeah. Um, but, but this reflects some uh, other reports that I, I've heard that b- being in good physical health, getting you know, regular exercise, fresh air, and exposure to a wide microbiome makes you far, far less susceptible to serious effects from the coronavirus. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, it makes sense. With the, with the homeless population thing, I, I, I would just question whether it is another correlation versus causation thing, because there are so many things that homelessness affects. Certainly, yeah. Although... Yeah, although I mean, I'm I'm sure a lot of them would tend to go the other way, like, like you know, poor nutrition and sleep and all that stuff. Definitely, would tend to make them even more susceptible. Yeah. So yeah, and, and I I did hear uh, some someone's theory with that homeless population was that it was vitamin D, that they they get a lot more sun, and that that boosted their immune system, and that to me felt like maybe that was a causation versus correlation sort of thing like how, how do you know it's the vitamin d and not these other elements i've i've heard that somewhere else like from my dad that um vitamin d is supposed to be important hmm. interesting so so we so we have these set of things that we can be pretty sure pretty safely assume that they affect your well-being in regards to covid the fresh air exercise wide microbiome vitamin d Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i'm again i'm i'm slightly skeptical but all that all that seems to make make sense always good to be skeptical right there's so many i heard this i heard that yeah Yeah. Uh, i'll definitely find the sources for that yeah there's still so much we don't understand about the human microbiome certainly yeah i guess i just get the feeling that it gets thrown around a lot (laughs) yeah yeah and kind of like invoked to justify a bunch of different things Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so so so, so we, we don't know exactly what, but you know something, something about being in good health and possibly uh, having a, a strong mm-hmm. immune system, which is strengthened by mm-hmm. having exposure yeah. to a larger microbiome. So so mm-hmm. I wonder then, and I, I don't think the answer to this question is immediately. I wonder, at what point do we start to put the onus of being in good health on each individual and say we're not going to suffer these extreme debilitating mental health issues when we could i mean it's, it's tough because I, I don't want to apply that that mental illness is is any easier to overcome than than physical illness but you know a lot of people who are born with with conditions or are more like susceptible uh, conditions that that can exacerbate covid like they can't really choose that and they didn't choose that mm-hmm. yeah i mean I, I don't think anyone chose any of it right but right. Y- you you do have a but good but i guess point. The, the idea of personal responsibility for your health like i feel like that mm. like don't don't you have you don't you have the same personal responsibility to take care of your your depression and anxiety definitely if you if you take yeah, that definitely line and 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 so maybe it, it's kind of like all around like if if you want to live then maybe it, we're in a situation now it's, it's a horrible situation but it seems to be coming to an impasse where if you want to live you have to put in the effort you want to say i want to live well enough to make myself better wherever you are whether you're at risk of dying from COVID or if you're suffering from debilitating mental health. 
right? But again, some people just can't. You're right. There's always going to be a minority of people for whatever the ailment, whatever the threat is, who are unable to do anything about it. And I, I definitely think we should take those people into consideration in shaping future social policies. There definitely needs to be a safe place for those people. But at the end of the day, it's an extremely shitty situation where a large number of people are going to suffer and die from it. I mean, again, my, my mind goes to people who are who are lower income and, and can't choose to stop working and, and have these these conditions. I feel like and they're they're I mean in the case of like, you know, being overweight or heart disease or something like that, like that's really hard to to tackle while you're also like working a, a really stressful like job with long hours and that kind of thing. Definitely. Yeah, I, I, I do not have the answers here. This is mm -hmm. this is a situation that is, you know, in very many ways intractable. I, so I I guess it, it's I mean I I know I'm coming across as having a, a very strong drive against social distancing, and I guess all I want to say I'm I'm not advocating for anything in particular. I'm not advocating for an immediate reducing of social distancing i'm not advocating for one group suffering over another i guess my main point here is just that maybe socially we shouldn't be so quick to vilify someone who does not believe that social distancing is the right thing for us to be doing Yeah, and and this is a very polarizing issue, and I do think it needs to be less polarizing because the answer is is probably not the extreme in either direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and there there are certain social distancing poli policies that that allow you know certain businesses to stay open and and get by without increasing cases too much. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is kind of a matter of a balance. I think it is a good discussion to have. Definitely, and that maybe it's something that really can be solved on an individual by individual basis that we be, because it's so unclear what whether one's uh, approach is better than the other right like you said it's such a narrow margin between if uh it, it's only that 30 million quality adjusted life years between our current mm -hmm. projected outcome with social distancing and just saying fuck it all none of it mm-hmm such a narrow margin so uh it's something that can be approached on an individual to individual basis mm -hmm. I, I said it was i i tried to make an argument that it was slightly insignificant i mean it's still like if i'm doing my math right like a seventh an improvement of like a seventh mm -hmm. about yeah um so like significant but but again, uh, given the the trade off, I think you have to make between life being reduced, its quality being reduced by depression and anxiety and addiction, and um, kind of leaving suicide out of the question because that that is that is you know yeah. death. Um, yeah, I, I still think you have to make an adjustment there, and and again, adjustment for the different populations who are affected, and um, mm -hmm. and that maybe I don't know. It's interesting because for me, this whole thing kind of pointed out some of the weaknesses of of this whole way of thinking in, in, of things in terms of, of qualities. Hmm. I, I guess I just don't, don't see um, why there should be a, a particular extra adjustment for lives versus quality of life. In, in fact, I think that's absolutely the core concept of quality adjusted life spheres is that it provides a metric by which we can make that exchange. And this metric that very naturally reflects our intuitive understanding of what would be worthwhile to live versus at what point would you rather have less of life yeah you're right you're right that is kind of the whole point yeah <laughs> of them but but i guess i guess what i'm saying is like okay so your life is 50 percent as good with with certain condition okay now it's 30 percent with this other condition what if there's a condition that's like makes it one percent 
as good of a life. And then like the difference to, between that 1% and just not being there. I feel like you have to, to make an adjustment for that. Mm. Well, and you know, maybe it could be, it's possible that could be like a positive adjustment. Cause mm. you know, I, I do think euthanasia should be, be a thing if people, if people, you know, choose it. But yeah, I just, I just think maybe that part isn't so straightforward. Interesting. That w- I, I'd be interested to hear uh, more about how you think that the, the metric could be enhanced. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's something I hadn't really thought of before. But because um, I mean, I, so Will McCaskill is, is a essentially ut- utilitarian, which means that he he says that you should maximize the over, uh, for the greatest overall good, mm-hmm. no matter uh, not no matter what the cost, but but. Um, the the overall good is the most important thing Certainly. and utilitarianism is is often criticized i think for being like too simplistic and kind of straightforward and and kind of like i don't want to say crude but like yeah not not nuanced not nuanced enough economics can really only go so far to describe the human experience which varies so much from individual to individual yeah yeah